Good afternoon. I'm Elizabeth Alexander, president of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and we are so glad that you're here with us today for a conversation that I've been looking forward to for a very long time. I'd like to begin by inviting you all to say hello in the chat. We would love to know who you are, where you're watching from, and whether you have any questions before we turn to audience Q&A at the end of the program. Reading Poetry, Engaging America, that is the spirit of today's event with and in honor of our country's extraordinary poet laureate, Joy Harjo. Joy is an artist unparalleled in her reach, her depth, her wisdom, her imagination. She's a poet, a memoirist, a visual artist, a musician, a playwright, an anthologizer, an icon. In her nine books of poetry, she sings our histories, weaving the voices of our past with metaphors of our present, illuminating the moments that mark us, birth and death, mourning and healing, devastation and celebration, fear and bravery. Who she is as an artist is not the only reason we are honoring Joy today. We are also celebrating her because of how she has led as an artist. As a poet of the Muscogee Creek Nation, as the US Poet Laureate and first Native person to hold that position, as the nation's first Poet Laureate from Oklahoma, Joy's voice and vision are central to her leadership. Across her career, she has lifted up hundreds of poets from all around the world and poets from across the country, including in her core initiative as our three-term Poet Laureate, Living Nations, Living Words. Because of joy, countless people across the United States have now read, heard, and celebrated Native poetry, poems from those who first lived on this land and from their descendants in the generations since, including those today at the forefront of poetic innovation and expression. She has never stopped engaging us in her luminosity with new poems, new perspectives, and possibilities about what poetry can and must do and has made the light of poetry shine ever brighter. I think of when I first encountered Joy's work uh, with her first book, she had some horses. It was, uh, maybe we'll talk about this later, sitting on the floor in Lamas Feminist Bookstore in Washington, DC, and coming across this book and reading from beginning to end, and hours later, uh, thinking about lines like, this and I give you back. I release you, my beautiful and terrible fear. I release you. You were my beloved and hated twin, but now I don't know you as myself. You are not my blood anymore. And reading these words, I am not afraid to be angry. I am not afraid to rejoice. I am not afraid to be black. I am not afraid to be white. I am not afraid to be hungry. I am not afraid to be full. I am not afraid to be hated. I am not afraid to be loved to be loved, to be loved, fear. And that was a life-changing moment for me uh, with someone who then became a fellow poet, uh, a sister poet and a sister friend. So uh, with all of that joy, um, uh, let's talk. We are so happy to have you here today. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for inviting me and for those kind words. And I wish it were in person and we will get back to that. But it's always good to see you even even in this in this manner. So thank you so much. And, and I yeah, <laughs> go ahead. No, please. Well, though, no, I was going to say you you were um, going to begin us with uh, a, a poem. And so we would yes. love to start that way. I will start with perhaps the world ends here, but I was going to say about the last poem, Fear, that poem, um, that poem would not have been written without Audre Lorde's Litany for Survival. It's very much, you can hear the echo, the echo mm -hmm. of her, and I consider yes. her what, what I call a poetry ancestor. So yes. anyway, <laughs> so the kitchen table, this is called Perhaps the World Ends Here. And this, this, some poems travel, and this one travels frequently and winds up at kitchen tables and different kinds of events without me, <laughs> yeah, but um, in with me. Anyway, this is perhaps the world ends here. 
The world begins at a kitchen table. No matter what, we must eat to live. The gifts of earth are brought and prepared, set on the table. So it has been since creation, and it will go on. We chase chickens or dogs away from it. Babies teethe at the corners. They scrape their knees under it. It is here that children are given instructions on what it means to be human. We make men at it. We make women. At this table, we gossip, recall enemies and the ghosts of lovers. Our dreams drink coffee with us, put their arms around our children. They laugh with us at our poor falling down selves and as we put ourselves back together once again at the kitchen table. This table has been a house in the rain, an umbrella in the sun. Wars have begun and ended at this table. It is a place to hide in the shadow of terror, a place to celebrate the terrible victory. We have given birth on this table and have prepared our parents for burial here. At this table, we sing with joy, with sorrow. We pray of suffering and remorse. We give thanks. Perhaps the world will end at the kitchen table while we are laughing and crying, eating of the last sweet bite. Thank you so much. And that poem has uh, traveled to the Mellon Foundation. It's uh, a, a poem that I've shared on multiple occasions because it says it says so much. Thank you. Um, wanted to start asking you about language and about uh, an early experience from your childhood of what you how you encountered language. What I remember is repetition of sounds and taking sounds into my mouth and sitting for hours just watching the light of them and watching the shape of them and listening. Um, but I often did that. My mother wrote my mother wrote songs. And so often I connected language with music, always with some kind of rhythm, rhythm you know, rhythm, rhythmic backing going on. There was a lot of singing in our house in those early years and my musicians coming to our house, a lot of country swing, some of the country swing greats came and visited. Mm. And, um, but also I remember the first poem, probably, I mean, I can't say absolutely for sure. And if I were writing a memoir, I would have to say that, but <laughs> is that it was my mother also reciting, um, little lamb, the little lamb mm. poem, who loves you, dost thou know mm -hmm. who made the, you know, that, who made that the, mm -hmm. William Blake, yes, William Blake, mm -hmm. that William Blake poem. And, and, and then the other place was when I started reading, I could not stop. I remember mm. I, I paid attention and once I got the code, it was kind of like a code or a shape, I read everything everything that mm. I could get my hands on. And I read through all the first grade, second grade books, and I kept going. And what about then um, making language or making with language? Uh, how did how did you come to think that that's what you were trying to do? That was a much longer road. I didn't know poets. I, I knew, I felt like I knew Emily Dickinson and she was from another time still her voice lived and and spoke but there were we didn't have poets in our neighborhood we had attention to language a lot of attention to language but it wasn't and uh it wasn't really it surprised me i was on track to become a painter like my aunt lois whose painting is right up over <laughs> over me and mm -hmm. uh, my grandmother, Naomi Harjo, because one, I, I liked going into, it was like encountering words with shapes and color. Mm -hmm. I liked going into that kind of space that did not need words because words to me were, I felt handicapped actually when it came to words or speaking. Mm. And I think part of it had to do with, and it's what happens to me in music sometimes, it's, I hear, it's like, I want to, to speak what I hear, and I can never get it quite precise. Mm -hmm. I can, you mm -hmm. know, I never get it quite precise, and I think that was part of it. But it wasn't until 
I was uh, at the University of New Mexico, uh, a BFA in art, studio art major, and it was part of Native rights movements. And it was the first time I met Native poets. I met, you know, there was Jim Welch, uh, Simon Ortiz, Leslie Marmon Silco. I knew her poetry before her short stories. And mm -hmm. I was there, Ishmael Reed came, Leslie came and taught for a little mm. bit. And Ishmael Reed, you know, who was very much at the forefront of this whole multicultural uh, literary, like, you know, we're also American, American writers, th that includes us. So I came, yeah, I lifted my head up and, and, you know, and opened my ears and it was right around that same, right around that time. And, and I started writing, I, I just started writing. The first stuff wasn't great, but poetry took over and it surprised me because my art, my life had been art. It had been drawing. I had been working towards that. And when poetry came, and I don't know exactly how, except I started listening to poetry, going to, I heard Galway Canal read the bear. And that was, mm. you know, you oh, can look wow. at, you know, the theme of my, probably the theme of my poetry is transformation. And that poem mm. is like the transformation, you know, it, it's, it's brilliant, that brilliant transformative, you know, poem of transformation. But I came to poetry as a way to speak what I was, you know, seeing and involved in as a young Native woman and as an activist as part of the Kiva Club at the University of New Mexico. And I was listening. I listened to what people said, how they said things. Uh, my teachers then, the creative writing teachers would say, use your natural, what are, you, what are your natural rhythms? What is, you know, your voice? How does mm. your voice fit? And I remember as a part of Kiva Club, we would go to many of those, um, hearings for your uh, with uranium companies communities would ask us to come in sort of like witnesses huh. and they figured since we were at the university we might know things you know and help them mm -hmm. and we heard testimonies of people talking to co-companies and they were so eloquent and i think that too had so much a part of what i began to why i get began in a way to explore poetry because there was something you know, those voices were very poetic and lyrical and they carried mm -hmm. history and they carried the history of like, you know, we know these lands because, and there were stories and, and it was, it was poetry, you know, it was their testimonies mm. were poetry. Mm, mm, mm. I'm thinking to so many things you just said, but the topic, the overall topic of your poetry might be transformation. Can you say mm -hmm. more about that? Yes. Well, sometimes, you know how people who aren't poets will say, what do you, what is your poetry about? Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, well, the, the worst question. Yeah, no, worst it is. question. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Well, what do you write like? Uh... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. What was the question again? <laughs> well, I, just... well, I was picking up just more on what you said about transformation. Yeah. Because okay. That's, I mean, I, I'm, I'm thinking and applying it to certain poems, but I'm fascinated by that as a, as an overall topic with many different manifestations over time too. Yes. I think it's because I came to poetry because poetry itself, you, you have this construction. It's like a transformer station and mm. you've got all kinds of time running through it. You've got rhythms and patterns and shapes and meaning you know through all of that and color and so on and so when you enter the poem by the by the title or the maybe you start in the middle i mean but you generally mm -hmm. use the to the title and by the time you're at the end of it and that's what i wanted poetry to do for me i wanted to be changed i wanted to be mm. have another door open to to knowledge or to um to perception Mm -hmm. And um, so that's how I went at poetry. I wonder, I think I still do that in a certain way, but things shift, you know, certainly you get older and your point of view, you you know, your widen, widens, I would think. Sometimes mm -hmm. you feel like you've lost everything, but generally <laughs> you get on a track. And so I think that I came, that the transformation is that I saw you know, the poem as a way one to transform language, to, to transform language, to take something that was unbearable, for instance, and at least find a little piece of light, like that light behind you, a little piece of light that mm -hmm. becomes a doorway. 
so that you might have a glimmer of understanding and this great image to hang it on that haunts you or this mm-hmm. sound or this rhythmic kind of thing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I wanted to talk some more also about um, the Institute for Indian American Arts, where you went um, in high school and what that school was like at the time, uh, what it represented more about um, how you learned there um, and, and, and what it meant for you to go there. Yes, the Institute of American Indian Arts. I went in the late 60s, and at that time, it was an experiment in Indian education. It was a Bureau of Indian Affairs school, but they added an arts curriculum. So it became an, kind of a, an, arts, an arts academy, so to speak, for many different kinds of arts, including writing. And uh, the students, we were from eighth grade to 12th grade, two years postgraduate. And now it's a full-blown arts college, even with an MFA in creative writing. I mean, it's come come a long ways. But when I was, we were, it was in the late 60s. There was a lot going on in this country. Um, the civil rights movement, the Vietnam War was going on. Um, you know, free love, and love is not free. <laughs> you know, free love. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and, you know, this, this kind of, I don't know if it's an awakening. We always knew we were, you know, tribal nations, but what was so cool was to be at that age, you know, that age where you're emerging into your uh, adult self and you're with artists and not only all artists, but they're all native from all over. Mm. So it became quite a, uh, it was, it was amazing because we would get into these discussions and talk about, you know, what does art mean in terms of like a Muscogee or, you know, we had tribal people all over and the stories, there were images. And even at the same time as we were dealing with all kinds of, of um, historic, historical trauma, et cetera, and we were teenagers. But it was mm-hmm. quite, we had some of the best arts teachers, many, most of them native. And it was the first time many Mm -hmm. of us ever had native teachers. They assigned, um, they assigned us um, advisors. And my advisor was um, Louis Ballard, who used to work with uh, compose. He composed once, I think for Maria Tallchief, Elisa's mother. Oh, wow. And yes. Mm -hmm. And he was, he was quite, he was a classical, classically trained musician and composer. And he remained mm. my, he remained my mentor my whole life <laughs> and loved it when wow. I got into music, but I didn't take creative writing there, but writing and poetry was very present. And I, as I was writing poet warrior, I realized that we were all of us, even, most of almost all of us were within a generation of virality. And so, mm. and I've noticed with people born within oral cultures or close to them like that, there is a greater appreciation for language and the power of words and the power of sound to transform. Mm-hmm. Wow. And then, you know, when you think about the, the history that any of us is born into, um, and you mentioned that multicultural, you know, multiculturalism per se, right? Um, yeah. And uh, I think often about um, the gift for myself about, you um, coming of age in a multicultural feminism um, mm-hmm. that meant that, you know, if you, you came out of your own uh, people's experience uh, that as, as feminists, the intersectional imperative was to uh, understand uh, how we were connected to each other uh, and to, to really, really, really learn uh, from each other. Um, mm-hmm. Can you talk some more about that, that multiculturalism and also c- coming into feminism? Yes, that was the University of New Mexico. I was working at I was working at, at the Native Student Center and we had the Kiva Club going on. And there was also feminism was coming about. And so that certainly I had stories, my mother, you know, I I had watched and then and as a young woman, have, you know, we were all experiencing uh, you know, not being able to, you know, the um, inequities. And uh, so all of that was, and then multiculturalism. So I came up, I came up out of that, 
I'm just trying to find a way to hang on or to move into this. I, I bet I, I recall, I think Wilma Mankiller, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, she was the principal chief of the Cherokee and, and so on. I, I, I started looking towards her. She found a kind of, I was thinking, you know, a native, a native feminism or sort of more mm -hmm. of embracing because I think our cultures were innately, many of them before, how do I say it? Before the Puritans, I don't know, you know, we're innate, you know, innate feminist. It's like mm -hmm. in that poem, the only poem where it says, washing my mother's body. My favorite part of that is when I, my husband comes in, well, we treated our, we treated our women like Queens, you know, in our traditional mm. way, that's how women are treated. Uh, the stove is a power place, <laughs> you know, it's mm, a, another trans mm. transfer transformation station. It's fire. Mm, you know, you're yes. like a fire, you're a fire, like a fire goddess and you're, you know, you know, what you make or what you do there has a more has an effect on how everyone comes up whoever's mm -hmm. cooking male or female you know it's mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it, it changes if you look at it as feminine you know culturally differently it um it you know it shifts so you know as a native woman and coming up at that time and i didn't always have the language of the words to try to i was thinking about these things but i didn't always write directly about them yeah. You know, how yeah, do I yeah. was supportive and I was part of it, but I what you know, I was there and part of it, but then you're always saying, Okay, well, where are the native women? Or mm -hmm. where are multi you know, where are non white women? And you know, I went through mm -hmm. we all went through all of that. But yes. it um, yes. it was a major force. There was it was a major force field that shifted. Although at this point, you know, as we watch these uh laws, you know, bizarre laws going down in this part of the country, it makes you wonder sometimes if anything changed at all. Mm, and yet mm, mm. I watch my children, the grandchildren, and I think, well, sometimes change, monumental change, is just like monumental stone. It takes, it takes a while. It's not, the changes aren't always clear, absolutely clear and perceptible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, you know, when you talk about um, folks like Leslie Mormon Silko or Ishmael Reed, I, I'm glad to be reminded uh, of, of their starting with poetry uh, and mm -hmm. moving into novels. Yes. I mean, Ishmael Reed's a great, a great poet. Um, and uh, there are a lot of others that we could put in that list. Um, mm -hmm. So, but, but you stayed with the poems. Um, and, uh, so I wonder both, I, I think it was a time when the novel seemed to be the way to reach more people, but actually over time, I think it's the poem that lasts. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I would love to hear more about, um, holding on to the poem, holding on to being a poet, holding on to making poems over time. Oh yeah. That's, that's kind of. I know. Yeah. Over time, because everybody has, it's like every relationship that, you know, there's times people think things are supposed to last forever. They don't necessarily, some things last for a long time. Some have an intense short period. And I think it's the same way with a relationship with poetry. I have a great mm. respect for, for poetry. And I, I say that like, it's, it's like a person or entity and my relationship with my particular um, poetry. I wouldn't say it's not gift, but that poetry, and it's not really an entity. It's that kind of energy that, you know, that um, kind of took hold. And so over time, my relationship with it has changed. I think I took, I, at first I questioned it and then I realized if I followed it and listened, it would show me all kinds of things. It still does. I'll be riding mm -hmm. along mm -hmm. and, you know, sometimes you're slogging and nothing's coming. And then you, you, you have to keep faith. <laughs> you have to hold faith and you keep going and then you're riding along. And then it's like when I was writing my memoir, the one line I remember is like, I'm riding along and then here's the poetry spirit. Yes. I'm writing 
prose, but poetry is still there. If I play saxophone, it's poetry, you know, for me. It's still your patterning and rhythms and all of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm writing along and the line comes, even the monster has a story. And mm. I thought, whoa, I had to sit with that. And I thought, thank you. Thank you, poetry, uh, spirit, poetry, um, guardian. Maybe it's guardian because, you know, I have certainly, um, there's been times where I've taken for granted. There's been times when I said, um, this is too hard. There's been times yeah. where I've felt I've been, I have been dismissed in my, in my time. You come up as an, as a woman, you're going to get, you're going to get mm -hmm. dismissed. And then mm -hmm. you come up as a, uh, a woman of color or, you know, you're going to get dismissed. I had male mm -hmm. poet friends. I've had say, well, the only reason you're getting published is because you're pretty or because Ooh. you're native. Yes. I've Ooh. had friends of mine tell me people don't like people who are much smarter than them, <laughs> you know, and so on. But in the end, and I've been turned down for things and, you know, mm -hmm. and sometimes I know the politics and sometimes it's just not, it's just what is, but you cannot, yep. I've learned, you know, that the poetry spirits, it'll stand there with its arms like this saying, okay, you know, why are you doing this? And that's what you have to stop mm -hmm. and question and why. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there's been times I remember when I moved to Hawaii and for a while, I, you know, my, my, language and words are so much here in, you know, New mm -hmm. Mexico, where I started, especially New Mexico, and then Oklahoma. And then here I am. And for a while, I could not, I could not find my, my footing, so to speak with poetry, mm -hmm. even though I mm -hmm. was being fed because the poetry spirit needs to be fed. It was being fed mm -hmm. with with uh, water and going out in the canoes and going out into the deep and all of that. Mm -hmm. And, um, but yeah, and that's the other thing I've learned that this poetry spirit can get hungry. Sometimes mm -hmm. you can wear them out. I don't think I've ever worn mine out. I don't, uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's, um, you know, you need to, sometimes you just need to stop and sometimes you just need to stop and listen. Yes. And I think also you're, you're, you're making me think that uh, writing poetry helps, helps you understand the gestation that is a part of life, uh, that yes. is a part of, of human life and of the natural world. And things just have to gestate. And mm -hmm. there are different periods of time. So it's not, you know, nine months or, you know, one time um, I uh, saw a, uh, I was visiting some friends and as you know, I didn't, I didn't grow up around um, horses and don't have them in my deep understanding as you do. Um, but I had the privilege of seeing a very, very, very pregnant mare one day. And then the next day, she had given birth to the foal and I was with a group of women and we were like, she is pregnant. Like she, we were all mothers, you know, you know, so yeah. we're like, wow. Yeah. Like I, I was, I was never that pregnant. Like she is the pregnantest <laughs> creature I have ever encountered. And then to see the foal on its legs, on its wobbly legs the next day to think, okay, that's a different kind of gestation. Uh, uh -huh. you know, what is born comes out in a different place. So, you know, just thinking about, um, about that cycle, um, uh, and how many different ways it can manifest, I think is one of the great lessons of, of tending to the poem, waiting for the poem. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and, and I think when you're younger, you get impatient with that. I used to have a rule that I would not get up from my desk until I was done with my poem. I think I was afraid I mm -hmm. would lose it. I would lose the momentum. And now it a poem, some poems do come quicker and some poems take uh, years. There's some poems I will pull out or songs too, I'll pull out and I'll work on them and I'll pull stuff up and then they kind of go under and then eventually you know, the, the poem I'll read later was I was going through and found something from about 10 years ago, mm -hmm. a little piece. Mm -hmm. And it's like, whoa, okay. 
and um, so it's it's like that. And and some of them, they're just they're like children in a way. I mean, everyone is different. Yeah, it's like every yeah, day yeah. is different. Yeah. Every one of them is every one of them is different. And some take ten years to be born. <laughs> That's right. Thank goodness, thank goodness, not in life. Um, and so then there are. I'm thinking about your about your music, and we um, have a, a clip, a quick clip that we want to play um, of uh, you performing from your one woman show, "Wings of the Night Sky," "Wings of Morning Light," which premiered at the Autry Museum of the American West in Los Angeles in 2009. So. We're going to watch a quick clip and then t talk about it and that part of your work. The challenge of doing this show has been really opening and digging and being at the same time and being in the story. And it feels like standing on a cliff every time the lights come up. And the rewards are, is, the reward is like any art is discovery. Every performance I find out something else. I cross the dark hallway because my mother's beginning to sing. She wanted to be a singer before she had all of us, before she got married, before she worked in the fields picking cotton and green beans, before she got married. When she sings, time stops and holds me close. Beautiful. Um, so, I, and we didn't see you um, playing the saxophone there, but that's also a part of your artistic practice. So if you could um, just start with talking about that piece uh, and how you came to make it and about your, your performance life. That piece came about because I perform a lot with a band, different people, Larry, I play with Larry quite a bit, who was, he liked to tell people when they were asking what he was doing, he liked to say he was in a one woman show. <laughs> you know, anyway, <laughs> he, um, anyway, um, that piece came about because I was doing a lot of performances or music performances, and I would start telling stories about the pieces that were coming up. And I thought, why don't I just write a play? Why don't I just write something around the music? which is what I did and um, with, with that play is I, I just, I, I, I just wrote, I guess I did kind of write around the music, although I did write some music mm -hmm. to go, you know, with musical interludes and so on. And Larry was part of that process of the interludes. Um, the, the, but um, yeah, that's how that one came about. I'm at work on another play, a musical play called We Were There When Jazz Was Invented. And mm. I'm in the middle of the book of it, but I keep writing. I've written some of the songs and um, I'm in the thick of that. I've been trying to write on airplanes, but I know I don't know about that for that. I kind of need a bigger room, <laughs> a bigger room mm -hmm. to work in for that. And maybe to move, I wonder, um, I, was, I was thinking as I was looking at you dancing, uh, wondering about actually moving when you're making things. You know, you talked about staying at the desk until the poem is finished, but I bet there's also moving when you're making sometimes. Oh, yes. I can't sit still. I have a hard time sitting still. So I get up and I do put a lot of music on and dance and move around. So if I say that I sat all day working on the poem, well, no, I didn't actually sit all day, but I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't venture too far away from it. I wouldn't go to sleep without thinking, you know, that I had it done. The next day I might look at it and say, oh, well, I need, I need to tweak this or that this isn't. But, you know, what's important to it, I always read it out loud. Even the anthology, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the, the big anthology, uh, When the Light of the World Was Subdued, the editors and I, we sat and read that whole anthology aloud, the, you know, the mm -hmm. final draft of it. And I do that with my work, too. I'll read 
everything aloud and not just by myself because you get into habits of hearing when you're by yourself. Yes, absolutely. So it's, it's, yeah. So it's good to do it with someone else. I've done that for all of my books since crazy brave, crazy brave. I, I did the final draft sitting in my mother's sewing room while she was dying. And uh, oh, I remember a, a former student of mine and we've been friends all this time. She was in an undergraduate class at UNM lives in Alabama. Um, uh, she's committed to three nights and I read uh, Crazy Brave aloud to get the final. And then I went back and did another whole revision or two. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, I think there's something about um, hearing it in your own voice, but also hear and hearing it in someone else's voice too, uh, yeah. that allows you to, you know, tune in that way. I was going to ask you about the anthology because uh, it's so magnificent and it's so um, huge. I mean, you know, you're really uh, doing a huge and important thing in there and not everyone, um, anthologies are, are such commitments. They're such hard projects. Um, they take up physical space. Um, uh, and so I'd love to hear more about it and what you, how you have seen it live in the world. Yes. Uh, when the light of the world was subdued, our songs came through the Norton anthology. It, yeah. Any, and it was quite a trip because it was to be a comprehensive anthology of native poetry, a Norton anthology. There really hadn't been one on native poetry. And, um, it was, I first, I'd had that idea for a long time, but I, you know, it takes a lot of people power. And then one day I was looking around at my students at the University of no Tennessee in Knoxville. And I thought, hmm. And then I got permission to teach some classes in like how to put together a Norton anthology, native poetry. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we wound up studying at the same time. And then decided I decided to put the anthology into geographical sections to divide it that way. And then I pulled together a team of uh, for the the uh, experts were all native poets because I remember mm -hmm. those early years, those early multicultural gatherings like at MLA and, yeah, and yes. I remember being at MLA and they would have the African American poets and writers and yes. scholars who were, who were African American. Everybody else had uh -huh. people of their own culture, and the natives we had all non-native. Our our mm. experts were all non-native. Mm -hmm. It's changed, it's shifted, but I, yeah. I always, it was all, it struck me then. And, uh, so it was, I was, that was really important to me that our, that our experts, our scholars were all native poets. And so what was really mm -hmm. cool is as we were reading, we did a lot of reading and so on that the students, we'd have Skype, this was BZ before zoom and they would, mm -hmm. we would have. Skype meetings with like the native poets who are involved, say with editing um, the Northeast Midwest. And so it was great for, you know, I, I like that way of putting together the anthology. The difficulty and the challenge, which is still there, is how if we have over 570 something tribal nations uh, in the book, first we had 300 page limit. And then we got it up to 400. But how do you make a comprehensive anthology of native poetry with those strict parameters? So that mm -hmm. was, that part was extremely challenging because of course there mm -hmm. are poems and poets who would fit and who should be part of it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. but we did, I think that the, you know, that the editing teams, the editing team, you know, we were able, I think, to pull out a, you know, it's a, I don't know, I think of all the poems being like these energetic forces and to have them there all together, it, it says something. It was important that we be seen as, you know, that people could really see and hear us as, as human beings, as human beings, not stereotypes. Yes. That's yes. big. And, and I think where a lot of other um, cultural groups have made inroads, it's still, we still, I think native people, we still labor. Like recently there mm -hmm. was a whole, at Disney, there is a, 
um, ah, high school group. That. Yeah. And it's like, how in the world? That's what was shocking to me. It's like, haven't we, haven't we learned, haven't people, and why do they hang on, people hang on to these stereotypes? And I remember when I was just starting to write poetry and I was still painting, thinking if by that, when I get to the end of my life, I want native people to be seen as human beings. Mm. And I think that's been the best, one of the best things about the poet laureate position, because it's gone a long way for people to see that, oh, you there are poets. You know, there's a, a department of interior secretary. Deb Holland, who is also my poetry student. And, I, uh, I was going to ask yeah. you about that. That makes me feel wonderful about what's happening in government, that someone who <laughs> was your poetry yeah, really. student is running the entire Department of the Interior. Amazing. Yes. Amazing. You know, the day she came, came in to ask to be in my um, poetry work, creative writing workshop, she came into my office carrying a motorcycle helmet. And she was carrying that. I, so I was asking her because I was intrigued. Oh, you have a motorcycle. What kind? <laughs> you know, and all that. Uh -huh. And she said that she, she had a motorcycle to save on fossil fuels. Wow. Yes. Wow. She was yeah. who she was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think also, you know, thinking back to the anthology and, the, and being understood as human beings, um, mm -hmm. that, you know, the way in which um, the poem, you know, is a, is a piece of a soul, is a piece of a, a, a human being, uh, is an energetic exchange. Um, I think about all of those uh, American poetry anthologies uh, where there were, are most American poetry anthologies where there are no native poets. Uh, uh, thinking about, you know, when just maybe one black man would creep in, mm -hmm. uh, yes. you know, I just those all days. of the ways you remember those days. I mean, you know, we came mm -hmm. up in those days. So, yeah, um, that kind of, you know, we, we are here and in our poems, we are human because our poems also come from, uh, the us that is larger than just the person who makes the poem, uh, I think mm -hmm. is actually really, it's a really serious corrective. Yes. And, you know, even I went to the University of I the Iowa Writers Workshop and I remember going over into town and going into the big university bookstore. And I thought, you know, I always look for native, you know, poet, poets and writers. And in Scott Mamaday, just a few years before, well, about 10 years before, had won the Pulitzer Prize for his uh, novel House Made of Dawn. And mm -hmm. he'd written, uh, you know, his books of poetry. Uh, anyway, I went looking for native literature. <laughs> in that, you know, 76 at that, mm -hmm. you know, where the only place I found it was in anthropology. Oh boy. The native yeah. literature was put in anthropology. It was not, there was, there was no native literature in the, you know, the literary, the fiction, poetry, literary shelves. And really, you know, I think that, that um, I, I kind of want to keep talking about this because it really, really does matter the human encounter that leads you to look at an anthology i mean i think anthologies are special because they become like um you know sacred books for for us i mean you you, you tend to you keep them for a long time you return to them you browse through them you don't necessarily read them end to end uh mm -hmm. you you enter you go out you re-enter um and so i think that 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 approach to the book is not the same approach that you take when you go into the anthropology section. The one that says, right. I want to find, I want to find a voice. I want to find a human being in these pages. Right. Right. So it really, really matters. Um, before we turn to um, questions from our audience, um, I wanted to um, ask you to talk some more about uh, your laureateship. Um, something that um, has made us uh, feel so proud and uh, so joyful. Um, and, uh, and it's been, so I'd love to hear just what you've been doing 
uh, how it's been, how you've done it in these uh, pandemic times, uh, and how you're how you've thought about the role. Well, it was quite a shock, of course, when that when you get that call. I remember, um, yeah, I always remember that. But I, I see my I've seen myself in that position. It will end the last week of April in as a doorkeeper, not a doorkeeper. No, not a doorkeeper. Uh, somebody who holds the door open mm -hmm. because there's all kinds of poetry going on. There was, you know, before and during this pandemic and during all of this political craziness and hate stuff and you know at, at, you know at the at the heart of it most people are you know most people you know most people like to hang out and take care of families and make poetry and all that and and you know and poetry you know poetry is crucial and i think that during the time of my uh, my uh laureateship was at a kind of very unusual time in that there was because of all these things going on and the pandemic and we didn't know we were losing we lost our major culture bearers in our tribal nation and that was true all over but people you know in these in these kinds of times we go to poetry we go to it's true for i think all human beings all over the world I, is we poetry it says, you know, here, I've been here all along. And, uh, and I knew you would come and find me. And it's during mm. these times that there, are, there was there is such a need for, for what poetry does and what poetry gives us as human beings, you know, mm -hmm. and, and so that's why I think this particular this laureateship has been noticeable is because of that. It's because it's been, you know, it's not really about me. It's really about the times we're in and the, and the need and how poetry has said, okay, I'm here and I've always been here and I will be here. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have turned to even writing, you know, writing poems. And as I've always told people in audiences, you don't have to be a poet to write poetry. You know, it's about listening, really listening and, mm. and having fun, you know, having fun with, language and with words and 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 finding what's there that you didn't know was there mm -hmm. in the underneath of the underneath of the underneath you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. accessing that that perception that's right that's right, right. and it was important there are so many that great people oh, go ahead <laughs> No, no, you go, go. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah, it was important that people knew that I wasn't the only native poet. And that's why my I did yes. the uh, Library of Congress, uh, the live project, Living Nations, Living Words. But I wanted it to be so much bigger. I got excited and said, let's put all native poets. Of course, you know, it takes a lot of staff and a lot of staff time. I wanted all the native <laughs> poets from time and memorial. Then I wanted all the poets because it's like we know we all are part of us, you and I, when we grew up in a generation of community, we all know each other and that, yes. we're, you know, and there's connections. Yes. We're all, we're all connected to Phyllis Wheatley and we're all connected to Walt Whitman and we're all, we're connected with each other. There's a relationship, you know, even if we were in opposition, so to speak, it was still, that's part of the dynamic and energetics of, of the American poetry world. So that was, the the map i really i wanted <laughs> was to show the root mm -hmm. the roots the native poets and then to show all of these interconnections like sandra cisneros who i went to iowa with and rita was there too rita dove and and mm -hmm. and so on i i wanted to be able to show all of that so maybe at some point we'll have that that kind of map um actually to that um little um poetry lore um you three were in the same class at iowa right uh, Rita and uh, Rita was the year before she she would came in a year mm -hmm. ahead, and then I was with mm -hmm. Sandra and I came in that same fall together, and we both thought of quitting mm -hmm. that same after a week or two in the writing workshop. Yeah. Yeah. What was that? What was that like? Because certainly it's not a, a place known as for being particularly welcoming to women of color in our traditions. Yes, and I, I think I've heard people say that it's changed. But what was difficult is if you 
you know, my work is, does not necessarily, I'm, you know, familiar with Greek, Roman myths, et cetera, you know, with, with literature, but mm -hmm. I didn't necessarily reference those in my work. I had, I felt yeah. it was important, you know, as I had learned in all of our discussions at Indian school, Indian art school, mm -hmm. you know, about these, and that's what I wanted to, uh, to hold up. And that, you know, it's, it's a sort of like not fitting, but then it's funny, you know, even the people who I thought were the darlings of the workshop also had the same, <laughs> you know, everybody was, uh -huh. you know, it was the kind of the angst of everybody who felt, you know, at odds or like they didn't fit in for some <laughs> reason or the other. Mm -hmm. And here, and here we are. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to turn to, um, there are fantastic questions. So I am, uh, I'm going to start um, offering them to you. This one comes from Roberta Lavador in Pendleton, Oregon. And this kind of um, segues from the laureateship. Can you speak to the importance of poetry in public art and how we can get powerful words in front of those who may not seek poetry out? Well, that's a good question. And it makes me want to ask her. It sounds to me like, you know, I'm because, because immediately I'm thinking about poetry and public art. And then immediately the first thing I think of is the, is those posters in the, in for on the buses and the subways with poetry. But I'm also mm -hmm. thinking about poetry with art, you know, as, as, um, not like it cracks, not, not, I'm thinking of something else. So I'm not sure that I can approach that correctly, except I'm, I'm not sure that I have the best answer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I really, the poetry on, um, on the buses and kiosks and literally yeah. encountering words like that, um, I think is such a, a, a simple genius thing um, that doesn't even have to cost a lot of money. Um, if you think about all of the time that people spend waiting and getting to and fro. And that, you know, as we all know, when we encounter a poem on the subway, you could spend a long time with it. I mean, you know, if that's what there is to read in front of you, you read it again mm -hmm. and again and again, which I think is actually, um, that kind of opportunity doesn't come along very often. So I think it's very well suited to poetry. Right, and it shifts your perspective in a way that, in a way, uh, it's been my experience because I've gotten to be where those, you know, to see poems in places like that you don't expect. It 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 can be startling, but it can shift your you're exhausted and you're on the, you know, <laughs> you're on the bus or something, and there it is, and it's like, a, you know, a shaft of light. I would like to see poetry mm -hmm. on, you know, on a billboard or you know, on a little sign on the highway where you're going along and you mm -hmm. don't expect it. And there's, uh, I think, you know, and I think people have done those kinds of things, but it, it does cause mm -hmm. a shift. Yeah. Um, this question comes from Tammy Tiger uh, in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, and uh, she asks, are there any Muscogee stories of spring that inspire your poetry or that you might share with us, which I think is a lovely question for the first day of spring. It is. And I wonder, I know of rabbit stories and then I've made some of my own rabbit stories. Rabbit is trickster. And if I think mm. of spring, I don't know any that particularly have to do with spring, except usually it's during the spring that the it's kind of like things are opened even ceremonially it's kind of an a time of opening because everyone is coming out from winter and into you know you know the birds i they you know the whole world the soundscape starts sounding different in spring the birds speak differently they're all getting mm -hmm. ready everybody's dating <laughs> you know or they're making nests <laughs> and there, mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm just listening. This is this spring, and they just it really. I could really hear it this spring about how they were shifting into another kind of urgent language, and there's all this yes. courtship going on. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so, I did write a poem called Redbird Love about that, about watching a, a bird family in this particular. I watched her parents or grandparents, and then here she was, and I watched her whole courtship take place outside oh. my window and uh it's beautiful 
It was really mm -hmm. it was a, beautiful to watch that. But I don't have any particular stories about spring. Yeah, you just told one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <You just. laughs> well, that's true. Thank you for that question. <laughs> Um, this question comes from Robin Gravely in Henrico, Virginia. Uh, as a Muscogee poet, Robin Gravely says, I deeply relate to many of the experiences that you share in Poet Warrior. You write about the mystical experiences you have had since childhood that eventually learned to express arts, music, and poetry. This rich, magical, spiritual knowing that we poets were born with is what we are here to communicate, the incommunicable incommunicable. What is your encouragement to young native poets who are on their journey of learning to communicate this truth? Do you believe that poets are the prophets of our time? If not, what do you believe the role of a poet is toward themselves, toward their community, and the world? And well, then, then the word mufto, 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 M-V-T, mado, ends that very uh, rich and beautiful question. That is a very rich and beautiful question. And actually I wrote years and years ago and I was just starting out as a poet and I was asked to write if somebody said, can, can you write a poem to encourage young native poets? So I wrote the poem, Remember, which was going to be a children's book that will be out in February. But mm. it's a remember, you know, I, I wrote that to remember basically to remember, you know, remember the earth whose skin you are and all these colors of the earth, remember the wind, remember, um, you know, all of that. I think for any writer, you know, young native poets, um, young poets, it's, um, it's really, it's ultimately, it's about listening. You know, people are so worried about finding their voice when their voice is right there. It's really about listening and practicing and and, and eventually the, you know, it's, 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 it's like you were saying earlier, Elizabeth, about gestation. Sometimes mm -hmm. the voice comes and drags you away like me, <laughs> you know, it was like the voice was mm -hmm. there and I have to honor it. I have tried not to write in my voice and it, you know, trying to be style, you know, stylish or be in the, in the mode of the time or the fashion, but it does not work. My voice is like, yeah. no, you, know, you will come back to me because <laughs> otherwise I'm not going to have anything to do with that. But it's important mm -hmm. really to listen and to um, and to uh, know why you're doing it. It's not it's not about you're doing it because um, often a poet or writer of any sort, an artist is is kind of the the uh, caretaker of the family's legacy of the story of what will go forward. Every family mm -hmm. has one, sometimes more than one. Mm -hmm. And we're the ones that keep history, you know, it's it, history lives in our poetry. Um, our mm -hmm. cultures live in our poetry. It might be in English and, um, or in, you know, partly Muscogee or English or so on, but, you know, we're kind of holding, we're holding the spirit of the people in what we do. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's important, you know, is to keep going and, and uh it's a practice you know mm -hmm. it, it's a practice i love and, um yeah. well, and that that uh that every family has one um mm -hmm. i think is really uh, i think is really true um i've heard uh, uh uh the poet david uh murrah talk very powerfully about the poet as the inquisitive child in the family the one who asks too many questions of the grown people. <laughs> yes, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think that both both literally and as metaphor, uh, that is uh, that is who who the poet is for the larger community too. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, here from Deborah Smith in Boise, Idaho. How can poetry help our fellow citizens to live in a more Whitmanesque notion of liberation, not mere liberty so i feel like that distinction between liberation and liberty is so interesting i would have to think about that one for a while because i'm thinking about what's a, a whitman-esque what was that a whitman-esque liberation 
and um, a, a Whitman-esque, uh, the difference between a Whitman-esque vision of liberation as opposed to liberty. And I think that's the gist of, of the question is like, we hear a lot about liber liberty, but, but kind of what is liberation and how can poetry uh, teach that or exemplify that or help people move toward that? Well, I think poetry is innately, innately does that. I mean, I don't know, I guess I've wondered about this. I don't, where is I going to go? I'm sorry. This is a question I have to think about and write and yeah, need, think and about need to, it. And I'll I would ask need you to write about it. Yeah. I, there are, are so many more, so we can, we can come back to it. Um, this from Tracy Morris uh and uh -huh. um poet and professor uh yes hi, as a tracy. <laughs> saxophonist uh painter and poet hi tracy uh what's your relationship to the breath and the line in those three disciplines saxophonist painter and poet that's a tracy morris question too <laughs> yes it is your relationship to breath and the line it's all about rhythm <laughs> you ask any band, you ask any, any, po it's all about rhythm, you know, and what is rhythm? You know, I mean, it certainly comes back to the music, but I think about that a lot. I think because I am a poet and I play saxophone, like I, I'll read some of the, especially the more I've played and the more I've improved a lot of the lines, I feel like I'm improving, even though the line might be, I may have worked it over and it's, re you know, and revised, there's this kind of energy that goes with it's what is in the poem how to write a i notice it there in the poem how to write a poem in a time of war like um mm -hmm. yeah just a minute there's a line that i always think when i um read this like okay soldiers crawl the city i always think of myself playing horn i get i start getting uh, soldiers crawl the city the river the town the village the bedroom our kitchen they eat everything or burn it they kill what they cannot take they rape what they cannot kill they mm. take rumors fall like rain like bombs like mother and father tears swallowed for restless peace like sunset slanting toward a moonless midnight like a train blown free of its destination like a seed fallen where there is no chance of trees. Every time I read that part, I always think I can play that. I can play that for you on saxophone mm -hmm. and breath mm -hmm. has, that's, you know, that's, you know, both with poetry and with, um, where even if you're writing on paper, it's still, or it's still a reality. You might write it down, but it is still the roots are uh, orality, you know, and, and a saxophone connects right into, oh, this is, Saxophone to me, it's part of poetry. It's part of orality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Only I'm get, mm -hmm. getting at it in a different. I'm getting at it in a different way. And of course, breathing is breathing and breath is all part of it. You know, there's a mm -hmm. rhythmic. There's a kind of rhythmic thing that goes on in uh, certainly the construction of 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 lines and and breath. I've always, anyway. I've always seen the construction of lines connected to breath. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. This question comes from Linda Barkis uh, in, uh, it just flipped down on my screen and it was a great question and it moved. Hold on. It's coming back <laughs> uh, from San Antonio, Texas. Uh, and Linda Barkis asks, after so much heartache in recent years, racial, political, environmental, do you still have hope for the future and do you believe poetry has a role to play and i would couple that with a, another question that's come from several people uh about um uh these last two years of pandemic and how uh that has both uh affected your writing but also uh on reflections on the role of poetry uh with the period we've just come through well, I think because of I, I keep thinking of this poem. I was just at the uh, Kent State. They have a wonderful poetry center there, the Wick Poetry Center, and they took me mm -hmm. out to the poetry garden, and they have poems on these. Uh, I should have photographed this poem, and I'm going to get a copy of it. A second grader, this incredible poem. I mean, it was just. 
her last name, she was like Rodriguez or something like that. But her poem was just one of the most amazing poems. They said she's in high school now and she's still writing poetry. And to me, mm. when I see that, I know that, you know, that there is a future. You know, when I see the eyes of the children, the grandchildren and, you know, in, in uh, the root of our tradition, I think it's probably at the roots of all of our traditions is that all the children are part of us, all of our children, they're all our children. And then mm -hmm. I know, and I see young poets, I'm always looking for the young poets coming up. I think we all do that to see what's going on, to see who's there. And it doesn't stop. You know, every, the, every age has its poets to help. You know, we have a certain, I think of a generation as being a, a person, you know, almost like a generation mm -hmm. comes in as a person to experience history and to speak and to be witnesses of history and to make change also at the same time. So I think of the role of the poet too, if you look at a role of a poet that way, you know, we're the ones who we might be prophets. Someone asked in the earlier question, we might be prophets. We might be, uh, we might be in trouble for truth tellers. You know, we might be truth tellers. Mm -hmm. Uh, we might mm -hmm. shift the form or shift uh, the way of approach that could be problematic, but mm -hmm. when it it might open something that allows, you know, allows in another whole way of thinking that refreshes the the story field. So, what was the rest of that question? I <laughs> there was. Yeah, about, well, I think about, that was, you know, I mean, that was, yeah. a, I mean, and that took us, that was a, just a beautiful meditation that took us right into the heart of the question. Um, the last, well, I mean, there are, are many more, but, um, uh, but the last one we have time for is for both of us. And it's from Alexis Pauline Gums. Uh, and it is, I have heard you both speak movingly on Audre Lorde's impact would love to hear anything you feel moved to thank her for today. Uh, I love that question. And um, uh, I could start because I had just, uh, okay. I, 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 and it's a couple things. Uh, one would be just straight up courage. Your, you know, your silence will not protect you. Uh, that's one thing. A second thing would be uh, you must name yourself. You cannot depend on others to name you kindly. You cannot depend on others to name you kindly. So I name the journey woman pieces of myself. Woman, mother, New Yorker, librarian, queer, you know, mother, all of those things. Uh, and that that multiplicity of self um, is something that you can't allow people to flatten in you. I, I feel like I'm grateful for that every single day from Audre Lorde. I second that. <laughs> yeah, her bravery. <laughs> I think about, yeah, it, if you think about the times that we came up, you know, and we weren't even in the textbooks, and here she is um, speaking, being brave as as to her identity, as to her perceptions, um, and your silence will not protect you. I still carry that with me. It's it's right in here in this pocket. Mm -hmm. Because because mm -hmm. we were silenced. It goes back to that question of feminism. We were silenced. It wasn't always directly. That's right. It could be indirectly, because I remember saying. I remember hearing why are you dealing with these feminists? You know, we need, uh, you know, our, our men need, you know, it, we were seen as not supporting men or not supporting the movement or not supporting, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not supporting native rights. And it's like, this has everything to do with it. Yeah. So she was, yeah, yeah. yeah. So her bravery too, that's what really her struck me and that poem, her poem litany for survival, which I, at one point mm -hmm. I had semi memorized, um, you know, I am not afraid. That's where that comes from. You know, that fearless, I'm yeah. not afraid to be that that's Audrey, you know, that's yes. Audrey's t teachings coming in there and the willingness to, she was, um, she had, she was generous with her. She was generous. She would invite young writers in. She, she made a circle wherever she was. And I 
remember I was mm. asking her about audience and she said she always saw a circle of uh, uh, people sitting around the fire and mm. everyone, you know, and, and when she would write, she would be sitting there in the fire, you know, it, you know, oh, at night wow. when people tell, when people tell those stories and people are, have yes. eaten together and are sitting down together as, as, you know, uh, as you, you know, and, and you might have differences. And I like the way that she dealt with, we do have differences with each other. We have differences in our That's own right. circles, in our own circles. And she flat out addressed that. I can't recall the exact words. She said it more than once is that, okay, well, this is, you know, that's open them up. Let's hear what you have. Yep. <laughs> you know? Beautiful. Um, well, we are um, uh, at time, but with time for you to please uh, close us with a poem. Okay, thank you so much everyone and, and Elizabeth for all your, uh, your tremendous vision and inspiration and your poetry through throughout all these years. So thank you. Thank you. And um, thank you. I'm going to read this poem without this poem surprised me. I think it's important they do. I, I don't always know where I'm going. I don't know. I can't know where I'm going or I, it doesn't compel me. But I had a brother in law pass from COVID. He was mm. funny and he was my uh, husband's favorite adversary. <laughs> you know, they loved each other mm. dearly. And he was big and then he was gone and I was trying to write a poem for I was asked to write a poem I was very honored and I was looking around and then I wrote this one but I realized it was not it, I was thinking about death and you know I'm closer you get to my age you're closer so this became not the poem I wrote for him but it was how I got into the poem it's those questions of death and life without the world will keep trudging through time without us when we lift from the story contest to fly home. We will be as falling stars to those watching from the edge of grief and heartbreak. Maybe then we will see the design of the two-minded creature and know why half the world fights righteously for greedy masters and the other half is nailing it all back together through the smoke of cooking fires, lovers trysts and endless human industry. Maybe then, Beloved rascal, we will find each other again in the timeless weave of breathing. We will sit under the trees in the shadow of earth's sorrows, watch hyenas drink rain and laugh. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joy. Thank you for this beautiful conversation. Thank you for, for you and all that you give us and have given us. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody who listened today and all of the wonderful questions and engagement and for taking your time to come and be with us. Um, we hope that you'll join us at our next event, our next virtual event, um, discussing Chinese American history on Thursday, May 19th, with more details to be announced soon. So please stay connected, follow us on social, join our email list. And uh, until we see you next, uh, 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 care and love to all. Thank you.